Thank you very much. Well, what an amazing inspirational start we've had today. Um, it's a tough act to follow, so <laughs> thank you very much, Costa. Um, as, as Steve said, my name's Andrea Crump. I work for the London Waste and Recycling Board, which probably, I would guess, most of you have never heard of before today. So um, I'll just introduce who we are. So we're a board that was set up by the Mayor of London about 10 years ago with the aim of helping the 33 local councils across London to meet waste and recycling targets. Um, and that's mostly done by our Resource London team now. I'm part of the Circular London team, and we work uh, to try and help drive the circular economy across London, and I'll speak today mostly around what we do. And we also have the Advanced London team, who are really around investment and business support and the key financial drivers to the circular economy. Now, this feels a little bit like preaching to the converted, but building on uh, what Costa was saying before about the need for a disturbance, the, the, the need for change and the opportunity that it's presenting us today, I'll do a little bit on why we need a circular economy. And I'm sure you'll know most of this already. So within the next few years, by 2050, our global resource use is expected to double, double from what it is today. Uh, that's a huge amount of resources that we need that we just simply don't have on this planet. We'll be around 40 billion tonnes short of the materials we need by 2050, which is a massive, massive problem for economies all around the world. It will impact everything from um, our food, our health care, uh, just how we live our daily lives. Um, within the UK, we still have huge problems with the amounts of waste that we create, and we produce 250,000 million tonnes of waste across Europe every year. You may be familiar with um, the diagram that's behind me. So this was released earlier this year. It's from the Circularity Gap Report, which is from the Circle Economy Organization. And it illustrates that out of all of the resources that we use in the world annually, we cycle 9% of those. So that little blue line, that's the only parts of our resources that we are currently recycling in, this, in, in the world. That gives us massive global problems. I'm not going to go into them because you will all be very familiar with the kinds of problems that we are creating with this unsustainable resource use. <clears throat> so one of the things that we think will uh, help us to solve the, some of the issues that we're facing in, in, uh, globally because of our resource use is the circular economy. There are lots of def different definitions, and I'm, I'm sure you'll have heard a few yourselves, but when LWARB, the organization I work for, talk about circular economy, this is what we mean. We are talking about making sure that the materials we use are circulating for as long as possible. It's about getting the most value out of the materials we use, making sure we use them properly before we even think about recycling them. Uh, and it's about looking at how we can look at new innovations, new materials, new ways to use waste so that eventually we remove waste altogether. There is no such thing as wasted resources. This is a very famous diagram by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which just sets out the concept of, of the circular economy. You may have seen it several times before. It's, it's quite a famous butterfly diagram. You have down the middle is the linear economy. That's, that's how we operate, basically, at the moment. And then on the right-hand side, you have biological materials. And the aim is, as you can see with, with the, the whole diagram, is as Costa was saying, it's about keeping things looping, like we have cycles in nature. We start to have cycles in what we're using in terms of resources. On the right-hand side, we have biological materials. So they are materials that can be uh, put back into the environment safely. So they're um, items that are not hazardous. And the idea there is to cascade their use, to use things as many times as possible before they're returned to the earth. And on the left-hand side, we have technical materials. So these are non-renewable, non, -renewable, non uh, 
and they are hazardous, sorry, they are hazardous materials, we need to keep them separate. They cannot go back into the environment. It's important that we keep them in their own loops. And the idea is that we keep those loops as tight as possible. The best thing, obviously, is to avoid using the, um, the resources in the first place. But it, when we do use them, the first thing we want to do is look, be looking at maintaining those things, repairing them, using them for as long as possible before we start to look at reuse, redistributing them and so on. So what we're trying to do is conserve the energy and the, everything that's been used to create those items, those objects in the first place. And it's not just about how we use things, it's about moving to different business models as well. So we're looking at products as services and the sharing economy to really help drive the circular economy forward. Why are people like London interested in the circular economy? You know, it seems like it should be something that businesses are doing themselves if it's such a good deal for them. Well, anything that, say, that reduces waste obviously has cost-saving benefits for councils, local authorities uh, and the government. We in London are due to have an increase in population by about 3 million people um, in the next 20 years. That is a huge amount of new resources, new growth that will be needed to meet those demands. But when we've uh, looked at how we could reduce waste, if we move to a circular economy in London, we would actually see our waste reduce by 60% rather than keep growing. And that's by 2041. Aside from those waste and cost saving benefits, it also has the opportunity to provide new jobs and new income sources for London. Um, by about 2036, we estimate it could bring in £7 billion worth of benefits and a net gain of 12,000 jobs into London. And when you hear about what's happening with the Chinese sword, resilience against virgin material prices, fluctuating markets is very important. So this is about building resilience against those things locally as well. So how do we start moving towards a circular economy? Well, usually one of the first steps is to look at a vision, where you are at the moment and where you want to be. Um, and the diagram behind me, you can see uh, in London, we have the circular economy route map. And this sets out the main opportunities, the main barriers, and key actions that we've identified in London. Um, about 100 actions, over 100 actions, are in that, that route map that will start our journey towards the circular economy. We didn't just do this on our own. Elwarb worked with government stakeholders right across different sectors to create this, this um, route map. And it identifies that the key drivers that you need really are, are these four things. Collaboration, policy, finance and innovation, and demonstration and communication. Um, and that as well is, is something that Costa was talking about earlier. These are all really important in, in taking us forward towards those first steps to a, a transition to a circular economy. So, first off is policy. Um, I will try and make it more interesting than it sounds. So, within London, we have uh, policies that really concentrate on the end of life. So, what we do once waste is produced, and we do a little bit on recycling as well. So, how do we move from waste management to more circular economy type policies? Well, in London, um, you may or may not be aware, we have mayors that have five-year terms. So every five years, we have a new mayor who has a new strategy and new policies. And the new mayor policies have come out in the last year. And in those, we are seeing a move from not just improving waste and recycling, but we are seeing new circular economy policies as well. So you can see there some of the uh, new waste and recycling targets we have. Um, but to really drive forward our secondary material markets, we have two big problems in London. Um, firstly, we have 33 different London councils. 
all of those councils have control over their own waste infrastructure, how it's collected, how often, what they collect. So we end up with 33 different approaches to waste and recycling, which is completely confusing for local people. I was amazed to hear yesterday that you have a yellow bin for recycling, you have a red bin and you have a green bin. Fantastic. I wish we had something like that in London. Uh, so one of the new policies is a harmonisation of collection. And the second one is, is a second big problem we have in London is a very, very dense population. Most of uh, the housing in London is flats and that is going to grow and grow and grow. So we recognise that there is a real problem with storage and separation for waste and recycling. So the new London plan, which is the um, London development strategy, actually includes requirements for housing to include space for uh, separation and um, storage of recycling. But they're still related to recycling, although it's improving secondary material markets. How do we ensure that we start to move to a circular economy. Well, we're starting to see general circular economy principles coming through in a lot of the different policies. Um, that They're not being recognised as circular economy, but it's things like flexible design, uh, making sure that uh, space is used uh, as much as maximising the use of, of space, and precision manufacturing, manufacturing things off-site bringing them on so that we save resources. But there are some very specific circular economy policies as well. The mayor has actually set out that his vision for London is for a low carbon circular economy. So this is the first time those, those two ambitions have been drawn together. So we're really starting to see how we deal with waste and all of our resources being tied into the climate change agenda. We also have, um, for the new uh, London development policies, a requirement that all new developments think about circular economy from the design phase. And the image that you can see here is actually in the London plan. And finally, large developments will be required to produce circular economy statements. So this will set out how they've embedded circular economy in their development, right from design all the way through to completion of the development. And um, we're working with the industry, uh, the housing industry at the moment, to identify what that should look like. How do we make sure that there's guidance and performance measures to make that happen? So on to what's happening more broadly across the UK. So um, we have a, a very mixed policy uh, landscape here. We have very high landfill tax, which helps to drive um, things up the waste hierarchy. But we have, in Europe, the lowest producer responsibility charges, which means that local councils and obviously local people are the ones that, that pay 90% of the costs for the disposal of hard to recycle items. Um, these three, di these three um, policies that you can see behind me have come out in the last year, uh, and they really start to look at the circular economy. So we have the 25-year environment plan, the, the um, clean growth strategy, and the industrial strategy. And embedded in all of those policies is the principle for maximising the value of resources, minimising the impacts of waste, and doubling resource productivity by 2025. So the UK is recognising that it wants to show leadership on these issues. And in the EU, there is a, a move away from waste management towards how waste management can help drive the circular economy. Um, you may have heard that the circular economy package for the EU was finally agreed in January this year. So it's, it was first proposed in 2015. And uh, because there are so many countries that need to agree, it has been redrafted uh, and relaunched several times but it was finally adopted this, this January. Uh, and that includes an understanding that we need better segregation uh, and recycling for secondary materials. Uh, 
and that we need to move beyond waste and recycling again. It does include binding targets. So these are targets that all EU countries will have to abide by if they're part of, of Europe. And it recognises that we need to drive secondary materials markets through things like eco-design, through better understanding of the data, so you can't manage what you don't know, and often we don't know how the waste data, that, sorry, how the uh, resources are flowing through systems, and also that we need new economic instruments. So um, some of the things that are being looked at in the UK at the moment, we have a uh, plastics, a single-use plastics uh, taxes and charges um, review, and that we hope that that will result in um, some things like percentage of uh, plastics recyclers being um, d made mandatory in certain items. We believe that the um, packaging recovery system that we have in, in the UK will be amended. It's, very, it's not very transparent at, at all at the moment. And um, hopefully that will help to drive uh, the charges from that will be, then be used to pay for education, pay for new infrastructure. Uh, the same as Australia, we are facing issues because of the Chinese sword. And that really has highlighted the problem of not having your own infrastructure to deal with uh, and re recycle it. We also have a new deposit return scheme being proposed, and I was really interested to hear uh, from the Minister yesterday about how the container deposit scheme is working in New South Wales, because one of the issues um, that's of concern to London at the moment is how that will work for local councils that already have um, the recycling set, uh, of, of such plastics set up and, and whether there will be any issues. So um, I'm reassured to hear that um, New South, in New South Wales it's, it's going positively. We also recognise the power of buying um, in terms of public procurement. The, in the UK, in London alone, we spend millions of pounds every year purchasing things as, as a city. And so the EU has recognised that green public procurement really needs to be a driver for the circular economy, looking beyond what you're purchasing to possibly looking at products as services instead of outright purchases. And finally, there's actually some metrics being put down to measure a circular economy. So this hasn't happened anywhere before um, because the circular economy is such a new concept. But um, in the diagram at the bottom there, you can see the different types of um, areas that the metrics will cover for the circular economy. And we've actually just um, undertaken a similar study in London for what we as a city will track to try and see how we are progressing to a circular economy. But it's not easy. As um, we were hearing yesterday, collaboration is absolutely key if we want to make the systemic huge global changes that we need to make to move towards a more circular economy. So we're not just talking about city to city, we're talking across entire supply chains, we're talking across different sectors. This really needs to be a global collaborative effort. In London, we're setting up a collaboration hub that will help bring um, businesses, public bodies together to look at these issues. And um, Amsterdam have got some really good examples of this already. So a couple of years ago, they set up the Circular um, Innovation Program. And they involve uh, research institutions, public bodies, and businesses, and they've set up over 70 projects, and they range, they're really varied. They range from things like data platforms to 3D printing with seaweed. Um, they are just starting to look at the results of that, so um, it, it will be really interesting to see how that's coming on. On the screen, what you can see is the new plastics economy, and this is um, a global initiative that was started by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, are one of the organisations that really has been driving public interest in the circular economy. And the new plastics economy is about bringing together 
all the parts of um, the plastic resources uh, chain from producers, designers, consumers, governments to look at how we, how we go about changing the impacts of the plastics um, that we consume. It's not just the plastics industry, we all use plastic every day. And this includes looking at um, the different, there's five different elements which you can see behind me. Uh, and really, one of the key things that's come out of this is um, two weeks ago in London, the UK Plastics Pact um, was launched, and it includes these four targets. So these are targets that the signatories sign up to, um, to deliver. And when it was launched, we had over 40 um, organisations based in London sign up. And those 40 organisations actually account for 80% of the plastics packaging that's used in the UK. So there's already huge, huge support for this initiative. And I know that the first, so the, uh, the top left hand, top, sorry, top right um, target has already been um, adopted by Australian government, so they've already committed to that one. And the aim is that all of the countries that are involved in the new plastics economy will come up with their own plastics pacts as well. As Costa was saying, demonstrating and communicating the, the, what we can do in the circular economy is so, so important. Um, and I just wanted to give a little flavour of, of some of the projects that local councils, local authorities and the government have been involved with. So the first one, so the first one you can see here is um, Ladywell. It's, it's, a it's a building development in London that is designed to be disassembled. So it's on land that will be built on in five years. But this is a fully disassembling um, uh, it's, well, it's, it's council housing that can be taken down and used elsewhere. The next image is um, probably one you're familiar with. It's a library of things. So the, it's about the sharing economy, making sure people don't have to buy items, they can lease them. We have a library of things network across London. And in Peterborough, they've taken that one step further and they actually have Share Peterborough, which is a platform across the city which people can um, use for sharing or reuse of items. We also work with some large fashion retailers and designers because we find that although circular economy business models make economic sense, often there's not the drive or the understanding of how to move to a circular economy in those organisations. So we're working with, with some of them to uh, take that journey and, and pilot those business models. We also work on um, the Love Not Landfill campaign, which is about helping young um, Londoners to reuse, repair um, and recycle their clothes. And um, we know that although they are followers of fast fashion, they really are prepared to make some environmental changes as long as they can still look good while they're doing it. Um, we have also a new um, trial with a buyback platform called Stuffster, and this is really interesting. We're working with a, um, a department store called John Lewis um, to help illustrate to people what's in their wardrobe, a buyback price, and so they can just um, let John Lewis buy their items back at the touch of a bottom. And finally, in London, we have a new refill campaign. So this is involving businesses and public places across London um, to register on a platform so that people can identify where they can refill their plastic bottles across, the, across London. And, and we get 1.2 billion plastic water bottles used across London every year. These are a few um, European projects. So the first one is um, beer that's made from waste bread. Kaulenborg is the, um, the image that you can see here. And it's, it's a really unique industrial site that has over 30 industrial symbiosis exchanges and byproducts between public and private bodies. 
The Buildings as Material Banks is a project across seven countries that looks at reversible buildings and uh, material passports. And finally, Retuna is something that was mentioned yesterday. It's um, in Sweden. It's a shopping mall that sells only repaired or reused items. It's, it's quite unique. Finance is a, another essential element of what you need to drive the circular economy. Because to make these changes, you, you need upfront capital, you need to deal with different financial risk, and you need, to, because there'll be different return on investment profiles, you need people that are going to invest in that and in the new innovations. So we have this investment program at Elwarb. In Scotland, they have something similar, which is an £18 million fund. And across the EU, because we have the circular economy package, the policy that I was talking about earlier, um, there are funds across EU um, to help deliver that, including the Horizon programme, which gives over 1 billion euro, sorry, just under 1 billion euros worth of funding for research and development. So there's real understanding of the opportunities that the circular economy can bring and the financial opportunities that are out there for the, for the first movers on this and, and the different organisations. And finally, <laughs> I know my time's nearly up, I just wanted to uh, say a little bit about some of the really interesting innovations that are happening. In London, we work with over 70 circular economy businesses, and I just picked a handful to talk about today. So the first one is um, by Skipping Rocks Lab, and they have produced OHO. And this is basically plastic-free water bottle. It's made from seaweed. You can pop it in your mouth. It, one of the ways that we see that it, it will be useful is we just had the London Marathon very recently. When you look at all the plastic bottles that are left on the road after that, it's heartbreaking. You can also put electrolytes and different kinds of um, glucose in this so runners can just pop it in their mouth. They don't even have to slow down. But you, they, this um, packaging can be used for anything. It could be for um, when you're in a hotel and you have the single-use sachets of shampoo. Don't need that anymore. The second one is aero powder. So this is basically insulation from chicken feathers. So waste from the poultry um, market that would have gone in the bin otherwise. And finally, we have BioBean. This is a very successful business which uses coffee grinds from your coffee, cup of coffee every morning and makes it into biofuel. That is it from me. I just wanted to end by saying local councils really have the opportunity alongside businesses to help drive the change to a circular economy. We know that we can't carry on as we are. As Costa was saying, we really are at a point where we can make things change and we can move to a model where growth and our economy is actually not reliant on exploiting the environment anymore and it, that it gives benefits to us as a society for our environment and for our economy. So thank you very much.